In this episode of the Backend Engineering Show, I'd like to talk about the log4j vulnerability, the remote code execution. So we'll, we'll discuss what is log4j, we'll discuss how exactly this vulnerability actually works and how dangerous it is. Yeah, we throw words like remote code execution for every vulnerability, but, but how? The question is the how here. And uh, finally, I'll, I'll talk about how really just adding features on your uh, software or your back end really need to think twice about every feature you add and what is the ramification of such feature how about we jump into it welcome to the back engineering show with your host hussein nasser and yes we are back baby we are back i'm back in town here and uh i know I'm a little late to the game talking about look 4 j because there are like thousands and thousands of articles and videos already about the topic, but it uh, doesn't hurt because I'm really fascinated about this uh, bug slash vulnerability. And it, it's so funny because look 4 j was literally been there for 20, 20 years. I first heard about look 4 j was uh, maybe 2006. 2000, I don't know why that, that sounds Japanese, or 2006 or this name, uh, 2006, that's the first time I heard about that, and uh, there was a consultant that came to our work, and uh, I was I was writing a software, and I wrote my own logging uh, facility, yeah, like some, some sort of a plugin that logs everything that have that happens on my application, and he said, no, don't do that, don't, don't roll on your own stuff, use this thing that's called Log4j, and it's, it's, it has a lot of features. It, I was like thinking, really? We need a software to log? How hard is it to log, right? Just write it to a disk, right? But the more you think about it, it's just you need to search the logs. You need to, you know, organize the logs. Like you need to, you need, you need uh, to specify what are you logging? Where are you logging it, right? Like, do you want it to write, uh, log it on a database? Do you want to log it on file system? And, and if this is a file system, what if you have multiple logs, multiple application running in multiple servers? How do you aggregate those logs? And if it's, it becomes complicated the more you think about it, right? Most users, if you're like your own thing, if you're doing your own thing, you don't really need it. But if you're building an enterprise system or big software, you need some sort of a advanced logging solution and log4j was the you know the de facto one for anything logging really so so yeah log4j very popular yet it wasn't as mainstream as it happened like 2 weeks ago whatever well, when we heard about it literally everybody's talking about log4j now. so what happened so log4j Right. When you when you build a backend, like let's take a web server and web app that is running on the backend, and uh, you want to log like failed attempts, right? Or uh, users who want to log in and like failed or someone tried to ddos you and you want to log these incidents or some sort of errors and you want to log them you basically use log4j to log these facilities are right? you on the back end uh, let's say i want to log every failed attempt right uh, to log in and I, I don't want to log the password that is used but i'm going to log the username so hey this username tried to log in from this ip address right so how how this how how would you do that you, the listener, or if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to the podcast, how would you actually do it, right? Well, I need to know the email that tries to log in or the account ID. That's easy because that's just another parameter in the post request, right? How would you know, for example, where this guy is coming from or which browser they used? Well, there is a nice header called user agent, right? You can read that user agent and then uh, read the body, which has the account ID, and then say, hey, this account ID, blah, the variable name, try to log in from blah user agent. You know, just normal programming stuff, and you write it. So you blindly take 
what the user sent, and then you send it to log4j and says, hey, log this. So log4j sees this as just another string, but this string has been sent by the user. And here is where the attack surface happens. I mean, this is a very common thing, right? It's very similar to SQL injection, really. And you really need to sanitize the input before sending it. All right. So this is what we'll look for, Jay. So this is what it's doing. And then this is how basically the attack can start. So in specific version of log4j, they introduced, I believe, log4j 2.0 in the beta version, right? They introduced the ability to kind of enrich the logging experience. You know, yeah, this guy has tried to log in, right? But it, they have the account ID. You, but you want to log more information, right? In the log. And you want log4j to do it for you. Here's the ID, but go and look up what the name of the account is, for example, and also print it. So yeah, we would say, hey, account ID, blah, take the same thing that the user submit. And then you would say, okay, between parentheses, this is the account name. And how do you get the account name because the user didn't send it to you? Well, you can look it up, right? Log4j can look up the account ID. And there are so many look up mechanisms and extensions in Log4j. This was introduced with an interface in Java called JNDI the Java naming and directory interface. So it's an interface that you can use to look up multiple things. So there was a JNDI plugin or uh, a component to look up LDAP information, you know, the, ac the lightweight directory protocol, access protocol, right? Uh, the, which is the implementation in Windows called Active Directory, right, of the LDAP where you can look up certain information profile about the user itself, like the, the full name, stuff like that, right? And you can print it or, or just print it in the log, right? So there is a specific URI that you can craft. And this is a legit thing. You can do it in, in log4j, right? So you, the programmer, can add that on the back end and then say, okay, so at the end of the day, so okay, account ID 17 tries to log in, parentheses, Hussein Nasser. That's the account name, right? So you know, and instead, so if when, you lo when you query the logs, you can see actually more information, enriched information. So that was, that was a feature that was added. Seems nice, <laughs> right? But here's what happened. What if that crafted URL was actually, right? sent by the user, right? So if, instead of me writing the actual account ID as a failed attempt, I'll write this specially crafted URL, right? I'll put it in the screen right now. It's JDI, whatever, slash LDAP, blah, blah, blah. The, 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 then you put, the, obviously, the, the server name where the LDAP directory exists, right? Right? And then you specify some sort of an object to retrieve there so yeah so that's how you do a lookup so the specially crafted url will have jndi and then we'll have the actual protocol which is ldap and then we'll have a url right the actual domain name right where the ldap lives the server and then slash some sort of an object like what what do you want to retrieve there okay and log 4 j will query that uh, first of all, it will resolve DNS if that has a DNS, and then so the backend is resolved looking at DNS. So keep that in mind. The backend log four J is resolving the DNS to an IP address, so it's sending a DNS request to get that the IP address, and then establishes a TCP connection on a specific port, whatever that port is, and then will then send the specific command of the protocol the LDAP protocol, and then start communicating with the server. Sounds okay until the user actually start sending the specially crafted URI from the interface itself. Well, how? 
the user can just type in instead of the account ID or the email, they just type in this special criteria. Okay, JNDI, blah, blah, ALDAB. And then the attacker website, right? That the, the attacker domain, which has the LDAP directory, and then slash the object, right? And then you send it. If you, as a developer, took that account ID as is, and you say, hey, just log that, forget about anything, right? Log4j will look at that. So, oh, that's a lookup. Let me do a lookup. It will blindly take a lookup, right? It, it will blindly take that string, resolve the DNS because it's that now it's the attacker website, right? Resolve the DNS, get the IP address, establish a TCP connection to the attacker server. So far, so far it's it's dangerous, right? But there is no remote code execution yet. Let's think about it. Let's let's just be very clear about this. So log4j, your backend just connected to a malicious server. That is dangerous because the attack if the attacker has control of the DNS, the resolution of the DNS, right? Itself is dangerous. Why? Just just take that alone. So if the, we've seen such attacks like this before, right? Where using domain name resolution as a vehicle to transmit information from the victim's machine. We've seen this with Apple. I think someone, uh, I'll link up the video, I don't remember, but uh, someone managed to uh, craft some sort of a uh, code that eventually ran on one of Apple's machines, internal machines, like the, the engineering, I think, uh, department. And then, from there, yeah, yeah, it was an NPM package, I think. I think it was an NPM package, right? And then, the, the, usually, you know, if, Apple have all sorts of firewalls, but nobody really controlled DNS as so far. DNS are usually, you know, benign. But what he did is, like, he took the machine name of the actual user that is running uh, the victim, the, the machine name, and then hashed it in a way uh he created a base 64 not a hash he created a base 64 and added it as a as a, as a subdomain to his domain right so it will take blah 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 uh, engineering machine one apple dot attacker.com so and then when the npm or the machine tries to resolve the dns it will basically hey ask the dns servers like ask the, the domain directed hey resolve this uh, dns for me blah 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 dot uh, attacker.com so to it it's just another domain that we need dns that we need to basically resolve so we'll just basically go through the dns protocol you know so it's okay who who owns a blah 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 dot attacker.com oh this is the top level domain it's dot com then attacker.com who owns attacker.com it's the attacker's dns server so the attacker just got a beautiful string that has the subdomain, which has the string, which is basically the uh, useful information about the victim, dot attacker.com. So they will throw the attacker.com, but they take this precious subdomain. Of course, they're not going to resolve the IP because there is no IP to resolve. Or maybe they'll just resolve it to some random IP address. Right, or just they will resolve always resolve it to the same IP address of the attacker because they have full control over the DNS. It's software, guys. It's just software. So now back to the four log four G. Just forget about LDAP and all the lockup. You just right allowed your backend to resolve DNS that the user specified, which can be an attacker. So what's what's wrong with that? Here's what you can do. Environment variables. Have you guys heard about it? If I, as an attacker, right, back to the failed login attempt, right? Go to the account ID and then named yourself, for example, dollar sign path dot attacker dot com and then put it in this LDAP thing, right? Crafted a string and then send it. So the login will fail, obviously. And as a result, you want to log that activity. So you'll take the account ID, which happens to be JNDI slash slash uh, LDAP, blah, blah. And then 
dollar sign path dot attacker dot com and then uh, send it over and you just take that string and then log it log4j will say wait a minute that's actually a lookup let me actually try to retrieve the ldap version of uh, the, the lookup value of this string that we just sent right because we're pulling some information here well oh what's this uh dollar sign path dot attacker dot com oh i don't know this is a dns i need to resolve it but before that dollar sign path is actually an environment variable on the back end so it says log for joe say oh you want to oh you want me to just paste the path directory the environment variable in this oh let, let, let me do that job for you so the back end log for joe will take the path all the beautiful paths that you have one environment variable at least right and then write it right to this entry right dot attacker.com so this beautiful subdomain right you might get some errors because of like some in invalid characters or so like so attackers can do all sorts of things to you know base 64 it or what now right and then resolve that and when you resolve it that beautiful string will end up in the dns uh controlled attacker domain scary stuff just, just again this is a way to leak information from the back into the attacker now just do that dollar sign jwt token dollar sign jwt secret any possible environment variable you can just send it along right so we still don't have a remote code execution this is just leaking information out right with just dns resolution right if that is even before we establish a tcp connection to the attacker's website after the fact that you got the ip address scary stuff man scary stuff let's take a sip of coffee so how does this remote code execute because what we read online is that oh remote code execution remote code execution so it's like someone's like installing stuff on the back end someone's i i read that someone has actually installed will manage to install a bitcoin miner i think it was a coin mine i don't know if it's bitcoin miner it's just one of those miners right and they managed to install it on the back end and that, that mines the stuff all the attacker nice at ease but how from what we read here is just okay the let's read through this all right even if the lookup that happens here in the string managed to uh, go to the attacker's website and retrieve some sort of a payload that is malicious even let's say it's code right you retrieve code and you then what look for j will just print the code right we'll log it that doesn't execute code right if you if you if you just uh, i don't know if it's java code even if it's java code just down download that java code and it will be just printed so the log will have the code but it will not be executed so i was like how does it actually execute look for just shouldn't execute just code because it's code it needs to be compiled and stuff like that so i did a lot of research and um, finally found a video by sans institute they did a good job in explaining how exactly this works and uh, it's another thing that is fascinating it it comes back to something i also used back in the day the the days of soap right which is called a serializing an object and deserializing object so if you have a, a vb.net or c sharp actual object that is your running on your code right a class that you instantiate an object out of it that object is just in memory right right java works the same way you have an object that is instantiated this object has properties methods functions you know has code in it right constructor all that stuff you can convert that object and store all its state right with all its state the properties and the values you can convert that into a string you can serialize that right just like we do in serializing json for example you serialize that into just a string a beautiful string right and when you take that string right you can send that string across the network and on the other end you can deserialize that string back to an object 
on another end. That's very similar to how SOAP works, right? When you start to send objects, you serialize the object and then you deserialize on the other end and you just now transferred the object to another server. That is the key here to the LDAP GNDI uh, remote code execution. So the attacker here, what he does, right? They craft the LDAP object, you know, the, the LDAP URL, such that it retrieves some sort of a string. But this string is a special string, right? When you retrieve, when, when the log4j retrieves that special string, it will detect that is actually not just a string, it's a serialized object. And here's the problem. Log4j will try to be smart and says, wait a second, this is a serialized object. Let me deserialize that object back to a beautiful object. So it will take that benign string. That's the problem. That was, that was the question that I had. How is it just a normal code or just a string end up in memory executing? That's log4j what it's doing. It was there. Yeah. Some people wanted to hydrate this object. Some people wanted to deserialize this thing. So they, they will deserialize that. And they put it in memory. And when you deserialize it, I'm pretty sure the constructor is being called again. I'm pretty sure. Or a method will be called. And you, as an attacker, could have control of all this method. And when, when the deserializer calls this method, put your code there, and it's the end of the world. You can just now, you, now you just force Log4j to execute code that you have put, right? So what happens here, there will become a deserialized object that has methods, it will have uh, properties, and it will have functions, that functions have code, and this code can do anything you want. Literally anything. Mine, delete stuff, if you have permission, love log 4 you have permission. It will have basically full reign. You can do anything. Scary stuff, guys. Very, very scary stuff. But... The moment I read about this uh, vulnerability, the first thing that came to mind was like, why is the back end even connected to the internet, right? Because remember, back ends should have no business connected to the internet. It should be isolated right deep down, you know, your infrastructure and just just isolated the only thing that is connected to it is basically the api gateway or reverse proxy or load balancer and that is basically even that shouldn't be connected to the internet to be honest there will be there will be another interface network interface which then connects to that other clients which can connect to the internet right right even but 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 that but that's not always you know possible you know back ends need unfortunately to connect to the internet you might say i saying why well we've made a lot of videos about this stuff right you know back ends are need to be secured with tls certificates right and those tls certificates you know with the, the problem with tls certificates or this is not this is not uh, unfortunately this is not written in stone you know nothing is perfect in the world of engineering that's what i found i started to find as the more i dive deep the more i i realized that whatever we're doing is is not is not perfect you know when you start learning things you now this is just another advice i i know i'm going all over the place right uh, you when you start learning back in general or engineering in general, you it's like a mountain that you have, oh, how do I learn all of this stuff? And it becomes overwhelming. And you become like an obligation to learn how things is done. But the moment you get deep into things, you know that all this stuff is built by human and human make mistakes and everything here have flaws. And we've seen this here. We take this like an, an a pedestal in a way that these things, these guys don't make mistakes. Like everybody makes mistakes. Whatever you, when you come to a domain, 
right? You don't know anything about, always doubt everything. Why is things doing, why is, why is this done this way? Oh, the moment someone says, oh, it's always been done this way because that's the best practice or that's the only best way, something fishy is going on. The, your questioning, your doubts are always in the right place. When you doubt something, that means something is, it's probably something uh, legit, you know, and so, so keep doubting. That's what I'm, I sorry to say. All right. So back to the certificate thing. So the certificates, you know, the uh, the way of authenticating servers, right? Unfortunately, we didn't find a solution to this yet, right? It's like, if I have a certificate, how do I know that this certificate is valid? Well, you might say I say it has an expiration date, right? Right. But it has an expiration date, right? Which which is baked into the certificate. But there's another problem. Certificates ha are, you know, are hashed or what's the right word for this? Are encrypted with the private key of the server, right? It's signed, that's the right word. Signed by the private key. And if that private key is leaked, we've seen many incidents where the private key was leaked, right? Then this certificate is useless because whoever had this private key can recreate that certificate and prove to be themselves, uh, basically, uh, you know, impersonate, impersonate the server, bad. So they invented this thing that's called the, uh, long story short, online certificate status protocol. I wanna know if this certificate, yeah, I know it's not expired, but I wanna know if it's revoked. Is this still valid? Is this thing, legit can i use it can i trust it so long story short i made it a whole video about certificates check out this video out but the fact to tell the client that this certificate is not revoked require a call to a revocation server right an online certificate status protocol an online certificate status protocol server that lives on the internet so the back end end up calling the internet to staple the certificate with a certif another certificate that says hey yeah i know that it's not expired but also it's not revoked yet it's good you can you can fully trust it so that if you have ocsp stapling then your inter your, your backend should connect to the internet, right? Now, even with that, you should really just uh, allow certain domains, right? You should never have full reign on the backend to connect to any domain, just specific domains. It's like, okay, I'm gonna allow the OCSP stapling uh, uh, server, I'm gonna allow whatever, uh, this backend and this backend, I might need to connect to this, particular API gateway for Amazon. I mean, with the internet, unfortunately, everything on the cloud, if you have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, you're connected to a lot of services, you find yourself needing to enable internet on the backend, try to minimize that as, mu as much as possible to have secure, because 99% of the time, if you don't have like uh, internet on the backend, then yeah, the, the backend Log4j will never phone the attacker home and you will never have this problem. It's through DNS. It, it, you really need to also stop DNS. And I don't, I'm not sure how you do that. Like, right? Uh, how do you stop DNS resolutions? It's just, I guess you can, you can have your own DNS resolution name server and then only allow certain name resolutions. But that will be difficult, right? So I suggest that you, um, I'm gonna link the video in the description, the SANS Institute, they go into more, way more details on about this, right? But effectively, they also have another attack. They go up also about the remediation, like, well, what do you do to protect this? I update to this particular version of Log4j if you are using it, right? And then all sorts of things, right? So yeah, uh, they also explain an attack surface where you can even even if you don't have an internet action, even if you don't have an internet access on your backend, uh, they f also find a way to, you know, exploit that, right? 
which I'm not I'm not sure how to be honest maybe the client sends an actual serialized object that just gets executed immediately maybe I don't know but yeah that's basically the log 4j attack very dangerous stuff to you that the adding features especially in, in a very popular software that is maintained by an open source volunteers you know it's just uh just fascinating how how the entire world is depending on an open source project and you see it because now there is a problem with the software now everybody's screaming apple relies on it minecraft relies on it amazon relies on it most the software relies on on logging facilities because they, nobody's gonna write their own logging right if you want they're gonna use an open source one and this one has been there for 20 years 21 years maybe more so it's legit but when things go wrong boy you know the war just sets on flame yeah there's a lot of a lot there are a lot of incidents where people actually using this um, this uh, attack right uh, specifically in scanning and you might say how, how do you scan how do you scan something like that right when you scan you basically scanning is, is not hard because think about it like what do what you, you try to guess what would the back end log right the back end is always interested in logging where things are coming from right so you would send that special crafted string which has the gndi and the ldap and the domain name of the attacker right send it in the headers send it in uh, you know uh, the origin right send it in any information that might you know benefit the back end of logging you it's a it becomes a guess game at the end of the day right so okay, i'm gonna guess and then we we'll just wait on your server to receive a dns query or if you don't control the dns doesn't matter receive wait for a tcp connection right because at the end of the day the back end will establish a tcp connection to your server and just for that i mean you can you can do so much with that as well like if someone is connecting to you right yeah it has a special protocol but you can you can control that protocol you can you can play with that right but yeah fascinating stuff you can you can find out where the connection are coming from so the server name you can find the ip address of the back end scary stuff indeed the scary stuff and in, stuff indeed so this, this is how scanning is is being ha is happening so now uh, the attackers who are scanning the internet are just logging the ip addresses of the infected backends not infected effectively but the the possible vulnerable backend that have log 4g the moment you get a tcp connection and we've seen many videos and twitter posts that people are actually doing that for tests minecraft just uh, send that to the chat <laughs> and and if the chat is you know uh, minecraft will log certain chats if it's like malicious or something like that and the moment they try to log it look for will kick in and do the lockup so remediation what do you do the disable internet on the back end if you can right try to kill that thing right you, you might worry about ocsp stabling don't do that and instead get a 14 week certificate from cloudflare right get a short as the shortest the certificate the better because if you have a short certificate then, you, then your private key is recycled right on on a on a bi-weekly basis uh, that's the shortest thing i've seen like 14 weeks which is amazing right and uh, then the next one is uh three months which is let's encrypt right and then yeah you can you can get a year but i think that now the browser consortium forces uh all the certificate to be at least one year i believe anything that we have on here is just not secure anymore uh attackers are finding ways around cryptographic uh you know cracking cryptographic stuff or not uh guys uh i'm gonna end this video i know i've been all over the place but it's been a while since i recorded a video so uh i know i talked a lot but it's just uh i had a lot to talk about i guess so so excuse me for this if this uh, episode was a little bit unstructured but uh, i guess some people like that some people don't like that but it is what it is and uh, i'll try to be more organized and structured in the
in the next episode. I'm going to talk about the Amazon outage next. Hopefully, if I have time. But uh, I'm going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome, Otis. Thank you so much. Goodbye.